1914, Arctic explorer Ernest Shackleton purchased a 300-ton ship that he planned on sailing to the very bottom of the earth, where he and a team of men planned to do the unthinkable, walk across Antarctica. He named his ship Endurance after his own family motto, by endurance we conquer. Although Shackleton and his crew never actually stepped foot upon the continent, they had to endure incredible hardships during their epic struggle for survival. When recruiting for this dangerous voyage, Shackleton posted an ad warning applicants of the small wages, bitter cold, constant danger, and doubtful safe return. Yet, there would be honor and recognition in case of success. Shackleton selected 26 men for his crew. Leading the expedition was seasoned Captain Frank Worsley, and Frank Wilde was chosen as second in command. Wilde had made trips to the South Pole previously with Shackleton, and the two were close friends. The group was comprised of sailors, two doctors, several scientists, and a photographer named James Francis Hurley, who would go on to capture some of the most stunning images of Antarctica the world has ever seen. Shackleton hired a skilled carpenter named Harry McNish, who was also known as Chippy, and was considered by some to be quite odd. Despite some apprehensions about Chippy, Worsley eased Shackleton's concerns by insisting that his skills were vital to the expedition's success. There was one unexpected addition to the crew, a stowaway named Pierce Blackborough. Pierce had applied for a job on the ship, but was declined because of his age, so he hid inside a locker on the Endurance until he was discovered by Shackleton on the third day at sea. Shackleton said, Do you know if there's a stowaway available? He's the first to be eaten. They get a lot more meat off you, sir. Ha! <laughs> introduce him to the cook. In addition to the men aboard, they had sled dogs to help their crossing, and Chippy's cat, Mrs. Chippy. On December 7th, 1914, just two days after they left their final port of call from the island of South Georgia, the Endurance encountered treacherous waters. For the next six weeks, the Endurance would ram through nearly a thousand miles of pack ice. Shackleton claimed it was like a jigsaw puzzle, but one they couldn't seem to solve. Then, on January 18, 1915, just 100 miles from their final destination, the Endurance found herself completely lodged within an icy wasteland, and the journey was halted. For the next eight months, Shackleton appeared optimistic for the sake of his crew. He realized if they could persevere until September, spring would finally arrive and the ship would be free. They had enough supplies to last them several months, but for now, they had a frigid winter ahead of them and it would be compounded by a lingering 24-hour darkness that would shroud the sailors. In order to keep morale high, Shackleton arranged shows that featured impersonations by the crew. He held nightly poker games in which he generously provided chocolate and cigarettes. Chippy even built goalposts out on the ice, and the men played soccer daily. But as the months passed, the ice shifted continuously, increasing pressure on the ship's hull. Chippy chased every leak, trying to anticipate where the next breach would occur, even if it meant that he would have to stand in the freezing water. He could plug the holes, but he couldn't stop the relentless pressure of the ice squeezing the ship's hull. By September of 1915, spring had finally arrived, and the crew was anxious for the Endurance to be released from its frozen prison. Shackleton remained optimistic, even though he knew that his ship was slowly being crushed. Then, on October 27th, a cry rang out into the night, She's going, boys! The worst had happened. There was a horrible cracking noise. The men dashed aboard to grab all their belongings. The hull suddenly caved in. Water! gushed into the ship. With nowhere to go, the crew found themselves trapped on sheets of floating ice as they watched the Endurance slowly sink into the depths. The men were now marooned. By December, Shackleton realized their situation was becoming critical. Life on the ice was incredibly difficult, with frostbite and hypothermia a constant threat. Food was in short supply, and the men had to resort to eating seals, penguins, whatever they could find to keep up their strength. Then one night, while the crew was asleep, the ice made a sickening crack. Chippy was thrown into the bone-chilling water. The men rushed to save him, pulling him back onto the ice. After hearing of Chippy's brush with death, 
Shackleton made a decision to save his men by moving them off the unstable pack ice. He plotted a course northwest and ordered the crew to haul their three lifeboats across the frozen landscape. If they had any chance of surviving, they had to reach open water and sail towards land. After hearing of the plan, Chippy was reluctant. He argued that dragging their boats across the ice would cause irreparable damage to them. Shackleton became enraged at his insubordination and his attempt to incite a mutiny. This tense situation was averted, but Shackleton would never forgive Chippy. The crew began their arduous trek across the frozen abyss, shedding excess weight and carrying only essential provisions. Shackleton even threw his own gold watch onto the ice to set an example. The men struggled to haul the cargo and made limited progress, gaining only a mile and a half per day. They encountered repeated setbacks. Sometimes the lifeboats would go adrift. Other times, splitting ice would create giant crevices that would separate the crew. Then, in April of 1916, just as all hope was lost, they spotted land off on the horizon. It was Elephant Island. The men piled into their lifeboats, but their passage to Elephant Island was difficult as they were tossed about by the stormy winds and icy waves. After seven long days and nights, they finally made it ashore, with some of the men just barely alive. Blackborough, the stowaway, was severely frostbitten. The team only had five weeks of rations remaining, but Shackleton felt that he could stretch it to three months by reducing each man's allowance. But more importantly, they couldn't remain on Elephant Island forever. Acting quickly in order to save his men, he assembled a team that would journey by lifeboat to find help. Despite their differences, Chippy was chosen to travel with Shackleton and made modifications to the largest lifeboat to ensure that it was seaworthy. Shackleton, Worsley, Chippy, and three other sailors set out for the treacherous 800-mile crossing to South Georgia Island. They were tossed about in the waves. Freezing water poured in with each swell. The stormy and cruel Antarctic Ocean drenched them from head to toe, depriving them of rest and warmth. For navigation, Worsley relied upon a sextant, which used the position of the sun on the horizon to determine their bearings. You see, navigating in the Antarctic was difficult enough, let alone by this method. 17 long days passed, and miraculously, they had arrived on the island. Malnourished and exhausted, they soon realized they had landed on the wrong side of South Georgia. Now they had to venture over the island's unmapped and glacier-draped mountains to reach a whaling port where they could obtain help. They knew this quest was their final hope for survival. It was life or death. With only three days of meager rations, they trekked over the mountains for 36 hours without stopping. They pushed forward, knowing that 28 lives depended on them to be rescued. Finally, as dawn approached on the 37th hour, they glanced upon the whaling camp. Boss, it looks too good to be true. They heard a steam whistle, and as they came around the bend, they saw whaling ships and a steamer spouting smoke. They had made it. They staggered into the whaling camp. Shackleton asked for the station manager, whom he had met two years earlier. Don't you know me? I know your voice. My name is Shackleton. Tell me, is the war over? The war is not over. Back on Elephant Island, many of the men were now frostbitten and suffering from psychological stress. As soon as Shackleton had disappeared, second-in-command Frank Wilde set the men to work, always keeping them occupied to maintain their optimism. Every day, Wilde would have the men pack up their gear and walk to the water's edge, hoping that their ship would come in. Roll up your sleeping bags, boys. The boss may come today. Four long months had passed. Then, on August 30th, 1916, one of the men spotted a distant ship smoke on the horizon. It was their fearless captain heading towards them. They were saved. As they approached Elephant Island, Shackleton was anxious. He looked out through his binoculars. They're all there. Even the stowaway Blackboro had survived. At Shackleton's insistence, the badly frostbitten young man was the first to be carried aboard the rescue ship. It had been two long years. They had lost their ship. They were marooned on an island. But now, the crew of the Endurance was going home. When they finally returned to England, they received a hero's welcome. Many would go on to tell the tale of their harrowing ordeal and their unbelievable escape from death. Shackleton began his voyage with visions of fame and glory. 
wanting to be the first to lead an expedition across Antarctica on foot. Instead, he'll be remembered for his unselfish acts of bravery and valor, saving the lives of all of his men, despite the peril that shadowed them every step of the way. You know, there's an old saying by a polar explorer that might sum up Shackleton's philosophy best. I'll find a way or I'll make one.